we look forward to a wonderful conversation. Thanks, Olivia. For, uh, thank you, Wayne. Thank you. Uh, thank right. Alessandra and Juliet and Malika for accepting, reading yeah. and talking with me today. So it's a, a great pleasure to be here. All right. So we, we are going to start now. Um, we're hoping uh, we have, we are, we're online. And um, Alessandra uh, and Juliet, thank you for helping us. I want to start out by sketching a little bit first why we wanted to do this, and then going more deeply into the conversation. And today we are extremely pleased to, um, to speak to somebody who um, has been a companion for us in the Research Center for Material Culture, and in our museum more generally, the Chopo Museum, Africa Museum, Museum of Kunda and World Museum. So we're going to talk to somebody who has been part of what we think of as practices of togetherness, as we try to rethink, reimagine better, more equitable futures from the perspective of the museum we inhabit. Today, we'll be reading, we'll be thinking with the work of Olivia Maria Gomez da Cunha, who is Associate Professor at the Graduate Program in Social Anthropology at the National Museum, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And Olivia is going to be part, and we are going to be reading together with her book, The Things of Others, Ethnographies, Histories, and Other Artifacts. And we're going to be thinking together with, um, um, uh, with Olivia, well, what is the consequences? What, why this book and why no? And how might we use this book in our attempt to think again about what the past means for the present and how we can mobilize, think through that past to try and fashion better, more equitable, just futures. Now the Thinking With program um, emerges from the Research Center for Material Culture, which is the Research Institute of the National Museum of World Cultures, which is um, the ethnographic museums in the Netherlands. We've been working as a research center for the last five years, and we've had several conversations, numerous conversations that attend more critically to the existence of such a museum like ours with all of its problematic history, with its difficult collecting and collections and exhibitionary history, with its own implicatedness in a colonial and colonizing project, and with the way in which it structures contemporary or is part of a heritage structure that some would say um, helps to hold together contemporary inequalities, including racialized inequality. So over the last five years and more recently with the Thinking With program, what we've been trying to do is to invite scholars and artists and curators and makers to think with us, to think again about how can we mobilize this collection treat with this collection, treat with this history in a way that connects with contemporary discussions in society, discussions that we well know are anxious discussions about the, flu the futures of our plural possibilities, plural lives in the world, plural cities, the future of a certain kind of plurality, but also anxious conversations around the planet we inhabit and what we ourselves are doing to the planet. So we invite thinkers who we think are doing exceptional work, wonderful work, work that can trouble us, um, disturb us, so that we can, as a museum, be better. Um, because we think, as a museum, it is not just a place where you collect things and show things, but where we participate in a conversation with the world about histories, histories that live in the present, and to think again, to imagine possible futures with these histories as starting points. Before Olivia goes, starts, I want to do something which probably she will be upset at me, but I'll do it anyway. I want to start out with, there's an image on the front of the book. It's an interesting and troubling image. And the book opens with saying the cover photograph of the Quabra Porta, the pot breaking, probably taken by the Brazilian folklorist Edison Carneiro in Bahia in 1936, 
is more than a beautiful and elusive image of what is to come. No player knows entirely what the pot contains, but everyone is ready to catch everything it may have inside. I want to use that as a starting point for thinking about this book. And I'll show it to you because it's not a small book. <laughs> so, this is a real problem. <laughs> We are anticipating what is, what is inside, waiting for what might come, what we might learn from the project. Before I move on, I just want to do one last thing by saying thank you to Kira Malika Daniels, who's Assistant Professor of Art History, African and African Diaspora Studies and Theology at Boston College. And to say that her research interest includes African and African Diaspora religion, sacred arts and material culture, race, religion, and visual culture, ritual healing traditions and black and African world. I've already told you a little bit about um, um, Olivia, who actually was also the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation Fellow in 2002 and um, had an appointment at the Royal ne Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences as a visiting professor at the University of Amsterdam and a visiting professor at New York University. She is a wonderful and generous thinker. And so, Olivia, I want to turn over to you to just introduce to us the book as much as you want, what it is you wanted to achieve with it, what were the exciting archival projects that emerged from it, and most urgently, how might we think with you and with this book as we try to think again about other better futures? To you, Olivia. So thank you so much, Wayne, for the introduction. And again, thank you for inviting me to join the research uh, center for this event. And also to be here with you, Kiria, Malika, and Alessandra, and all people from the, uh, from the center. So it was nice to, to know that the image uh, in the cover of the book called Your Attention and made you to think about the project itself, about the various way that this book address different issues, but somehow all of these issues are related to the materiality. And so the image of the pot breaking capture, in my point of view, a sense of the unexpected. So when I, uh, I, I found this, this photo in the Artu Ramos archive, I was very impressed. Uh, first of all, because I thought the image was very beautiful, the, 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 the play of colors and light and so on. Secondly, the fact that this image was taken by um, a character that is not very known uh, in the history of the African-American anthropology, Edson Carneiro. Uh, he was considered a folklorist and became very famous in Brazil, but not outside Brazil. It's not common to find many references, analysis, and readings of his uh, writings in, in, in books and in articles written about the history of African-American anthropologists. Third, the, the, the game, the play of the pot breaking is very interested and because nobody knows exactly what uh, will come out from the pot. And this is capture the idea of the archive, at least the idea that I try to pursue to follow throughout my book uh, that has to do with the fact that the archives are, are a kind of artifact in, in an ever going uh, changing, in an ever going shifting uh, 
that put us in certain moments in the position of observers, in other moments in a position of subject, in other moments in a position of authors, uh, and in, 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 in others as objects. And so the archives make us to think about our own positionality and the way we can be, we can be authors, we can be researchers, but we can be others in some point of view. So the, the archive and this kind of archive made us to think what were and uh, actually uh, what are our role in doing ethnography, doing anthropology, doing history. And so I tried to pursue the various way that the archives change this way uh, of uh, being related to different subjects. So this is the, the, the main idea of using these photos. I think it was very emblematic also because it shows people trying to catch what you will come out of the pot and not some authors and, 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 and people that appear as being the main characters of some of the more canonical histories of anthropology. So, but I, I would like to present somehow this book, uh, trying to track some moments of discovering, some moments in which I, myself, uh, realized that I, I need to learn with the things that I put my hands on. And the first, of, the first moment when I realized that there were uh, an attempt to build an, a, a, a scientific area to, to deal with, uh, to cope with the, this subject, the Afro-American, uh, Americans uh, was when I was doing my PhD research. I was using uh, a specific archive, the Arthur Hamos archive, but I was looking for a very different kind of source, kind of evidence. I was looking for the relations that link some Brazilian anthropologists in the Brazilian state uh, during the 30s uh, in criminological and law discussion about vagrancy. So it was when I, when I come up with uh, being interested in, in, in tracking and following the conversation specifically among anthropologists about African-American anthropology. So it was somehow weird to find that the same character, Arthur Holmes, that dealt with law, uh, criminology, discussion about prison, prisons, about um, the way of classifying people racially, socially, psychologically, was the same guy that was considered to be the, the, more, the most important specialist uh, on Afro-African-American anthropology at that point. Uh, when I finished my PhD, I decided to go ahead trying to understand what kind of network Arthur Ramos was involved with, uh, what other um, intellectuals, um, militants, uh, historians, anthropologists uh, were involved, and what were their role on it, what, were, what they were aiming to in the, in the terms of uh, I asked myself if they were aim the same thing, what they have in mind when they talk about um, 
Afro-Brazilian, Afro-Cuban or Afro-American, uh, what they have in, in, in mind. Uh, what they, uh, how they train to be specialists on it, what kind of people were important to them uh, with uh, uh, people with uh, they interact during their researchers in Brazil and in Cuba and US. So I, I, it turns out to be a huge project and I had to cut the networks somehow because it, uh, otherwise it will lead me to Haiti and, and Jamaica and other places. And I, I, I need to, to figure out how to do. And I decided that instead of following uh, these actants, these actors and characters, uh, through their search for the Afro-American subjects, I decided to look at the archives. The look, to look at the archives that they built in different moments of their careers and look at the archive we use when we look for more understanding about the history of the discipline. So this is not a history of the network. This is not a history of different networks trying to understand how to understand how they connect, but this is a, an ethnography of the archives that um, produced, created understanding about different histories of uh, the discipline and in, in different contexts. So in the introduction, I try to analyze, I try to uh, sketch somehow the, my, my points and my aims in, in, in the search of a different sort of understanding about the uses of uh, the artifacts. So for me, an archive is a, very unique sort of artifact in a way that it opened the possibility of many positionalities on different kind of shiftings, uh, as I said at the beginning. Um, to doing that, I need to pay attention not only uh, in the characters who lived during the period I was looking at during the 1930s, but it was important also to me uh, using my training and skills in anthropology and being an ethnographer, using the archives in the same way or somehow in the same way uh, the ethnographers use the archives or, or used to go to field work. And so I began to pay attention to the, all the procedures of classification, of um, 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 nomination, of um, donation, of uh, choosing institution to donate archive, the uses of this sort of archives to different kind of, com kind of communities. So to me, mainly in the first chapter, it was impossible to understand what the archives kept, what the archives uh, uh, could offer to us as a researcher without paying attention to the way this artifact was created or it was manipulated or it had, uh, it suffered a different kind of uses and, 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 and became different things uh, throughout uh, a particular history. And so I, I decided to, to use the idea of Marcel Mose, the seminal um, analysis of the gift uh, 
to understand um, process of donation. Of course, I couldn't go into uh, details about this process because each archive, each donation uh, left different kind of evidences of registers. And so I tried to connect somehow what to me seemed to be more interesting or more important about that. And then I realized that the same people that appear as being the authors and the main characters of the history of anthropology could be seen as subject of different sort of manipulations, different sort of uses. And so in this moment, I realized that the process of making of an archive had this sort of participation. The same people participated in the creation of their archives, in the, this, the definition of what kind of things they, they want to amass, what kind of things they, they want to preserve, uh, how they thought about the, the experience they had in the field work uh, to be transformed in a kind of material artifact, how they did that, and uh, how they create this sense of being another sort of altars, you know? The, uh, and so the archive, uh, or looking at their archives, or looking at the way they create their archives, gave to me this sense of um, achieving this double procedure of doing an ethnography of the archives, but also doing an anthropology of the histories of the American anthropology. Um, so looking at the gift, I realized that uh, in certain moments, these authors, they guide us in the way we use their material, we use their archives, we use their documents. Uh, but it not um, uh, preclude, it not um, making possible to see other kind of actors acting, moving, participating in this process of creation of, of uh, an artifact of knowledge. And so I realized that many uh, people that were subject of this author's research became very important in this process also. And so I tried to track the different moments in which an archive, a personal archive became an archive of the discipline or an archive of the African-American anthropology. So having this in mind and using this sort of concern in the first chapters, I divided the book in three different parts in which I use my contact with the archive, with the artifacts in the archive to imagine or to propose other kind of understanding about the, the, our past in terms of the discipline. I, I thought in terms of what would be a history of African American anthropology looking from the point of view of the singular archives. And I realized that they were ever shifting. So it would be impossible to think about a linear and totally interconnected history that made sense for all of us. Uh, because in, in each situation, these positionalities were uh, playing a different role. In the first part of the book, I 
besides the first chapter, um, uh, I tracked the, the, the creation of uh, Fernando Ortiz archive. Fernando Ortiz is a very interesting author because he uh, deserved many, many analyses and books and writings about his production, his book, his career. But uh, a few, uh, few of this, this analysis uh, paid attention to Ortiz archive. Ortiz was obsessed about uh, keeping things and organizing things and classifying things. But the most important to me was to uh, perceive that Ortiz used material things, clippings, as the main um, uh, uh, kind of source of his most important book in his early career, the Los Negros Brujos. And so I, I try to understand the way he mobilized it, uh, the French criminology, Italian criminology, the discussion about race in, in Cuba. At the same time, uh, he um, was a very attentive collector of clippings. And so his Negros Brujos uh, uh, were, was, first of all, uh, a reading about clippings, a reading about things that he amassed. And from this kind of things, he created a kind of theory about the presence of uh, African people in Cuba in the, in the early 20s. And in the second, in the second um, chapter, I, I tried to include more people in this conversation. So I included, for instance, a, a known, um, a not well-known uh, name as Romulo Lachatania here in this discussion. But to me, it was important to see in some, in some critical moments in which all these authors were invited to think about their project of creating an area in anthropology, but not only in anthropology, about the African, Afro-American studies in these critical moments, how they um, converge and in other moments uh, they appear completely separated in terms of posing questions and answering questions. So uh, this, this moment of dissonance that appeared to be very visible in this attempt to uh, gathering and organizing meetings in Nevada and Port-au-Prince and, and Bahia and, and Washington DC, in this moment was very clear to me that they were not talking about the same kind of things. And so it was really a, a, a confirmation of my, my, uh, uh, my first uh, thought about uh, the need to think about this material in terms of multiplicities and not as a completely organized web of interactions and proposals and plans and projects. I don't know, I know that we don't have time enough to go through the whole book, uh, but in the, just sketching a, a little bit the, 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 the plan of the book. Uh, in the second, in, in the third part of the book, I, I try to, even though, is still following the making of these artifacts of knowledge, I try to make this exercise of putting other people in the conversations. So the idea of the things of others um, had in mind um, to attempt to see what will happen and what happens when we look at the subject, the Afro-American studies, 
from the point of view of other actors. So in the chapter eight, for instance, I use many um, notes and diary notes written by Lorenzo de Turner, uh, Melville Herskovitz, and, and Franklin Edward Fraser uh, that reveal that people with whom um, these uh, characters, these authors, intellectuals had contact in Bahia uh, were very much aware of what they want to talk and how they want to talk. And so how they want to be seen, how they want to be um, capture in terms of image, in terms of knowledge, information. And, and so it was a kind of game in which authors, uh, uh, for instance, as uh, Melvin Herskovitz knew that he need to create a kind of third person, a third author, uh, through which the conversation between someone that don't want to be revealed, don't want to be seen completely, don't want to, 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 to tell the secrets of their religion, his religion, her religion, could speak. So Melvin Herskovitz created with his informant a kind of third person, a completely artifactual character uh, through which the communication could take place. So it was very interesting to see how this negotiation uh, occurred, how they happened during uh, the couple, Francis and Melvin Herskovitz field work in, in Salvador. And at the end, um, I decided to make a very short uh, fieldwork experience. It didn't aim to be an in-depth uh, fieldwork, um, but I realized uh, listening to some recordings and looking at some photographs when I was in the US uh, that people or the descendants of people that participate in this research during the 30s and mid 40s, 1940s in, in, in Salvador, uh, could be interested in looking at this material. But more than that, more than going back with this material, I was interested in um, learn with them and learn alternatives way of looking at this material, or testing the confrontation between uh, a, an archival form, a way of looking at the history of the discipline through the archives, and another kind of perspective, or better, perspectives in plural, that show me the different levels of the knowledge that was in a way capture in a photo or capture in a sound recording. And so for me, it was very, very illuminated. And as a book and a research uh, have, has he, its own temporality, this final chapter, uh, actually, it illuminated the whole book. So since the beginning in the process of writing up the book, I was illuminated by the things I learned in this final experience uh, I had in Salvador in 2003. So I think we can discuss or talk about specific uh, parts of problems uh, of the book uh, I had, and I think I, I should stop here to give more space to you to interact, to both of you to interact. All right, thank you, Olivia. 
Um, I think I'm live again, and a few things. Um, one of the things I, I want to go back to um, later on, which is uh, just a kind of quick conversation with you about this, this, this making of the archive and what is at stake in that project, um, especially in relationship to early anthropologists um, and early some of the early thinkers that you're working with, so, so as the rest of it, um, and how their work actually um, influences some of the work that we do now in the museum. And what is at stake for that? I, I'm exceptionally interested in Herzkovitz as well, because you know some of his collections um, of the, and working with Maroons ends up in, in, in collections across Europe. And what might we think, how might we think about that collections in the present and what, what he was trying to do or they were trying to do in that moment. I'm very interested in, in, in something that you start out with in, in chapter, in, 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 in the first chapter actually, when you speak about leave the past in the past. And that ties to something that I think is quite exciting now with the matter for the pot. Um, and somebody actually asked that, one of our companions online asked that, they said, I hope we can discuss the metaphorical concept of breaking the pot in relationship to the museum. And if the museum is the pot, what do we need to do with that Part to be able to think otherwise about what is inside, to, to redistribute knowledge, to think about questions of distribution. So I would love to go back to that question of the part, what is inside as a museum and what that might mean. But before we do that, I just want to hand over to Kira and, and, and ask her for her own reflections on her own questions, because we are not here to necessarily tell you to criticize in a certain sense. We're here to think together about the project itself and what, what the project can offer us and to suggest if you were to do it again, how, what else could be done. So that's how we can, we want to approach it. Kira. Over Hello to everyone, good morning and my time and good afternoon, your time. I want to first start by um, expressing my gratitude for being invited to join this conversation. I want to thank Alessandra Benedicti Koken, especially for the thoughtful invitation. Uh, Wayne Modest, thank you so much for this warm introduction and warm welcome. And Olivia Gomez da Cunha, thank you for this magnificent work. It has been an absolute pleasure to engage with your book this week and to begin thinking through quietly and now with pleasure in conversation with you about your work and these contributions. Um, and I have to say that this feels like much more than a coincidence. I've been writing and revising a chapter on the mystic use of pots in Haiti in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and in fact, I am doing research right now on the ritual tradition known as Kasikanari, which is a tradition in Haitian Vodou that is the breaking and the shattering of the sacred vessel which is a clay pot associated with one's selfhood. Um, what's very interesting is I think that we can, I, I have to say that I found that uh, opening quite compelling as well. And so I'm glad that it has opened our conversation. I think it's a really fruitful entry point because there are ways in which I think the pot can serve as a metaphor for our discussion. And there are other ways in which I think that its actual materiality can engender some very interesting conversations about the ways in which we engage with knowledge collection, acquisition, process, and the production of knowledge. In the Kasekanali ritual of Haitian Vodou, it is understood that one, when born, has multiple souls. The Haitian concept of the soul is very similar to many African multi-soul complex understandings, that one has a soul that exists outside of the self, inside of the self, connected with higher spirits, and it is understood that when one undergoes the process of initiation in Haitian Vodou, that you have what's called a potet, a soul pot that is assigned to you. And when you experience uh, initiation, this soul pot is consecrated with you. So an aspect of your soul lives in this pot. On the other side of initiation into an ancestor, you might say, there is the Kase Kanari ritual in which the Kanari, a very large clay vessel is shattered by the community. And this is a way of representing the shattering and the rupture that one experiences and that a community experiences when somebody transitions. Um, but it is also a way of releasing the souls into the universe so that they may be reborn again. 
Um, and I think that I might add briefly here that there are many mystic pots in a number of different traditions, but I do want to point out one more in Haitian voodoo that I think will be, again, a wonderful way of thinking through Dr. Dacuña's work, uh, which is the govi. The govi is a sacred pot, a mystic pot in Haitian voodoo that is used in many different ways, but it is used in part as a home and a residence of the ancestors. Once somebody's soul has been released during the Kasi Kanavi, an ancestral soul is eventually called back from the spirit realm and placed in the Govi so that it can serve as a divination implement. So the spirit can speak through the pot, the ancestor can speak through the pot. And we think about you know, the power of the cave and cavernous substances or cavernous vessels, if you will. I feel very much that Dacuña, this is what you are doing. You are, in fact, calling into the cavern to bring forth the voices of ancestors, those whom we are very familiar with, such as Herskovich, such as Lorenzo Dow Turner, as well as those who have perhaps been more silenced in the archive, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm eager to share a few thoughts about your work and then please um, to hear other thoughts from our, our audience participants as well. I want to start um, by noting that you you mentioned several times in the text and also helpfully here again for us that the archive serves as a unique form of artifact. And I think one thing that, that really strikes me about this is encouraging us to regard the way that humans and that people serve as archives themselves. And we too, therefore, become a sort of living archive, um, especially in the context of conducting ethnographic work, in the context of conducting oral histories. And what that raises, I think, is the possibility for people as archives to challenge the written colonial histories that have been left behind and as we know of course written by the captors if you will um, i think that that presents some very exciting possibilities of the work of excavating voices and calling forth the intellectuals as well as the lay scholars who have done so much work in thinking through their cultural experiences their religious identities their their cultural heritages, but perhaps have not gotten the attention that they deserve. But I think this presents a possibility for, you know, recalling these voices is not simply an act of uh, dusting something off that has long been forgotten. It is in fact transforming the archive. It is in fact transforming our understanding of the present reality. So I, I thank you for thinking through that um, and presenting that to us as possibilities for new ways of conceptualizing the archive. The second thing that comes to mind is um, the role of others, outsiders, insiders, and etic versus emic voices. Um, I think one thing that has really been exciting is being, you know, I have heard of the name Artur Hamus, um, but hadn't known about his incredible influence in Brazilian intellectual history, his contributions to the field, even his influence of many ethnographic scholars uh, and historians who came from the United States to Brazil and conducted research. And I think that this is extremely important, again, the word that comes to mind is excavation of history and of intellectual histories in particular. Um, I do my own work in Haiti and I cannot help but think of parallels and connections with those such as Jacques Roumet, um, the novelist who has, you know, contributed so significantly to Haiti, not only as an artist, as, you know, a, a novelist, but also as the founder of the Bureau d'Ethnologie, um, where generations of Haitians have been trained to study Haitian history, Haitian culture. Um, but in fact, it was his exchanges and interactions with Alfred Metro, who was a Swiss anthropologist who came to Haiti, who was conducting field research in the 1930s and 1940s, that began conversations with him suggesting, you know, I understand that you've returned Jacques Roumet from exile, Perhaps this might be a good time to think about what do you want the legacy of Haitian history to look like? Can it be remembered beyond just individual classrooms and individual people? If so, what would that look like? Can you imagine, you know, what a museum would look like here in Haiti? And this is not to suggest, of course, that, you know, this is only an external, um, you know, gift of knowledge, but rather that 
you know, in countries and nations such as Brazil, such as Haiti, such as Cuba, that have for so long relied in black communities, African descended communities on oral history, because those were the archives that we had in our power. This shift was such an important one so that oral histories could continue to be valued, hopefully, in along with uh, written archives. And so it's very exciting to think about the types of connections that we can envision between um, figures who are well recognized in Brazilian history, such as Artur Ramos, such as Jacques Roumet, but also realizing the ways that they exchanged with these US scholars, with these European scholars, um, and made influences on these own scholars' work. I think that's something that perhaps doesn't get discussed quite as often, and that is very rich for um, thinking about uh, what contributions get remembered, um, even thinking about Fernando Ortiz and of course Lydia Cabrera, right, are one of our few women ethnographers who has received a significant amount of attention in conversation with what does it mean to be a local scholar? What does it mean to be a scholar who is not on the outside looking in from a national perspective, but perhaps has an outsider perspective coming from a different class background? or coming from a different uh, religious background. I think this is something that really warrants greater attention because it is so important that Brazilian scholars are writing not only in Portuguese, but also having their works translated in or at times writing in English so that wider audiences can see this is not something that, this is not a region, this is not a site that only foreigners have studied, but rather there are Brazilian intellectuals, there are Haitian intellectuals, there are Cuban intellectuals who have a long history of archiving, you know, the cultural legacies and, and where does that take us. The final thing that I wanted to reflect on in your work, Olivia, is um, how much I appreciate your attention to the process of knowledge acquisition and production. I think, you know, if I um, recall in your chapter on the Herskovitzes, on Lorenzo Dow Turner, on um, Arthur Hamus, there's such a, a rich uh, understanding here that books and documents serve as objects themselves, right? We understand them as archives. How do we understand them even further as just collections? You use the term assemblage at one point. And I think that this is such a helpful term because interestingly, it's a principle that exists in a number of different cultures. Um, this idea that a collection of objects are more than the sum of their parts. So in Haiti, this concept would be uh, conceptualized, theorized as rassemblage. And the Haitian anthropologist Gina Athena Ulysse has done some work theorizing this concept of rassemblage, which is a compilation of things, objects, ideas, people, events, right? So moving beyond the expanse of just material objects or just people, but including a wider, broader span of entities. Similarly, in Kikongo, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, there's the notion of kumbika abundu, very similarly, a collection of multiple entities and beings that create a completely a new form of selfhood. And so one of the questions that I want to pose, particularly in thinking about museums um, and in thinking returning to our pots, if we will, um, is not simply thinking about pots and objects as metaphors, but really as material works and archives themselves. How do we understand pots differently if we understand them as archives of history? How do we understand sacred bundles? How do we understand crowns? How do we understand baskets? How do we understand these objects that we use to tell history as archives that have their own stories to tell? And that can in fact tell very unique narratives that perhaps cannot be communicated by humans in the same way, that cannot be conveyed in the written record in the same way. There is a reason that as you know, I'm a professor like my several of my colleagues, I like to bring my students to the museum because I think that there are things that the objects can communicate to them, that they can convey to my students that I simply cannot. And so I think I'll leave it there for now and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Well, thank you so much, Malika, for this wonderful thoughts, this wonderful comments, and I hope to address at least part of them. But it was great to, to to see you returning to the pots, because I, I made note of the question uh, Wayne posed about the pots, the, the need to go back to the pots. And, and so I, I, I think we, we need to stress a little bit um, this image. Um, 
I think we were very, um, uh, we, we made a very interesting and important point comparing and bringing all the sort of assemblage and pots and Congo and, and Haiti and Voodoo cosmology because I think they bring uh, us um, a, a very um, important and, and point that appear in the first chapter of the book, at the end of the chapter, when I try to get all these beats of information, beats of comments about the way these authors imagine their archives, their collection. And I try to sum them up with the idea that uh, these creations were somehow, I didn't use this word particularly, they were a sort of magic in a way because people infuse what you call entities. They infuse things in this process of putting things side by side because the idea of a, 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 of a relature somehow that make, makes relations all the time. The people who amass the material, they were making relations. They are putting things and giving meanings and creating meanings and offer meanings to a relation in which they were part of. So the, this relation were not, they were not too, uh, they, they didn't took place in a moment that these people were unaware. They took part of it. A second point is that the image of pot to me uh, was in a way a metaphor, of course, but more than a metaphor. Because I was very uh, much interested in knowing this play between the inside the pot and the outside the pot. And so when you look at the photo, you see that a lot of things is happening around the pot. And if you look at the archives in a very straight way, I used to, to make jokes with my, my students about the way some traditional historians go to the archive with the idea that they will open a black box that all the new things will be revealed because these, these things were kept there, uh, hidden uh, from the eyes of the public. And I used to say nothing, that is nothing inside. <laughs> Everything will be created in the moment of the opening. And this moment of the opening, to me, should be in relation, the moment that those people opened and created their archives in the past in the moment that I, as a researcher, opened their box, their archives. And we are all the time adding things. So trying to connect the, the two parts, the image of the pot and the idea that the self is, different selves were created in this process of amassing things. In the case of Ruth Landis is very, clear that through the archives he created herself as a character as an author so it was a process of doing these two things side by side but uh, how would be an anthropology of history of the afro-american um, program or project if we look at the moments in which different things were infused in this material thing. So I, I, in the, in taking this um, sentence, I, I want to address the, the, the question of the museum. And so the idea that uh, thing, uh, things are uh, somehow uh, vessels, things are open space to create new things. So archives are vessel in the same thing, in the same way Anganga is formed. 
or a Haitian pot is formed. So the archive is a place in, in which different sort of creation infused things, uh, agencies coming, coming from different parts in the, in the whole stories I told about the, the distribution of parts of the Herskovitz uh, legacy through a Northwestern Schomburg Center and, and other institution. In a way, this, in this moment, empty spaces are created as collections. And so I want, I, I want to hold you to that point because I, I, I think that there is, there is a need from us and I think that Kira are really um, tied to that as well. In, in our discussions of the book prior to even the book coming out, one of the figures, you, you go back to Herzkowitz. There was a need in your work to go back to Herzkowitz and the importance of Herzkowitz's work um, to this early anthropology. And so one of the reasons I want you to elaborate a little bit more on why I go back to him. I mean, you could also say some people have been very critical of Herzkowitz. I'm not going to call any name of anybody who's been critical of Herzkowitz. I don't want to get into any problems here. But many people have been critical of the work that he did. Some people even call it sloppy in a way. So my interest is what more precise than perhaps you should tell the audience generally who is Melville or um, Herzkowitz? And what more precisely do you think that a return to his work and his, both him and his wife's work is important for the present? And actually, I want to ask that differently as well. How would a return to that work help us in, in our museums today to think about what is present or not present in the archive? So first, Herzkowitz. Uh, yeah, Herzkowitz. <laughs> Uh, it's a very um, problematic, in a way, uh, author because I I would say I can't find no uh, name any name of, uh, of people who didn't made criticism uh, <laughs> yeah. on her. But it's because uh, I think. More recently, people like Vince Brown and others are trying to raise different ways of addressing Herskovitz. I think is a very, um, he was a very complicated character in terms of the, the kind of relationship that he uh, uh, used to have with other authors and other um, uh, native or uh, interlocutors in the fieldwork. But to, to, to answer your question in a more uh, direct way, uh, why I return to Herskovitz, I would say I wouldn't say that I return to Herskovitz. I would say that it was it would, would be impossible to do a project like that, leaving Herskovitz aside. What I tried to do is, was decentering Herskovitz. I think it was an exercise that I did. And so many books that deal with the history of African American uh, anthropology put the Herskovitz in the center of a kind of arborescent or genealogical history in which all the other authors in Haiti and Brazil and, and, and Jamaica in a, in a very early moment um, uh, were somehow linked to the Herskovitzian project of creating a scientific area to Afro-American anthropology inside the North, uh, North American anthropology. So it's important to, 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 to recognize that, that the Herskovit plan addressed the North American anthropology. It was very, it was completely different uh, when we compare with other authors in other situations. For instance, 
the comparison and the counterpoint that I did uh, between Malinowski and, and Herskovitz. When you put these two authors, having Fernando Ortiz in the middle as a triangle of interactions, it's very interesting because you can see how we can decenter Herskovitz of his pos position as being a main character of it. Uh, but, but my, my colleague Kelvin Yelvington made a very interesting point when he made some comments about my book and he said, actually we too, because he is doing a, a, a kind of a, a biographical and, and, and study about Herskovitz um, in a certain period of his career and he said, uh, we discover that uh, what Herskovy did all the time was amassing things that people were doing in Brazil and Haiti and in US and, and you know, he had this capacity of looking from above and organize it and creating links that could be recognized through a scientific point of view, through a disciplinary point of view. So he had this role of the organizer, the, 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 the who, who, who is, uh, will be concerned with the, um, uh, with the definition or creation of an epistemology and so he was the one who looked at the other as being folklorist. The others are folklorists. He maintained, he kept all the time his position as being anthropologist. But um, I need to also uh, say that um, we, we need to take care when we see a character like Herskovitz um, understanding his whole uh, through a very long period of time. I would say that we can uh, recognize different Herskovitz and different dialogues. Herskovitz in dialogue with Hartu Hamus, Herskovitz in a difficult dialogue with Malinowski or Du Bois will be in, in, in different positions. So my idea, my concern with the, the, play of, the, the play of different shifts in this process of creating an area of research is very interesting because if we, we look at the dialogues, with, we look through the exchange of the letters, through the, the, the criticism raised by some article published and the, the reaction of an author through a letter, all this position or this, this position as being the center of a, a whole project could be destabilized in a way, could be completely out of place. I want, to, I want to ask you a kind of question now, which is a little bit um, probably outside the frame of the book, but very in, important for the frame of the book, the role of Suriname and what role Suriname plays within the development of, 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 of this early anthropological work that you're thinking. Because one of my concerns, for example, um, and, and I might invite Kira to also speak to this is, is how the Caribbean plays out in the early definition of what anthropology is as a discipline and what might that mean for how we understand the museum. Now, within many museums across Europe, one sees, I am going to be very terrible when I say it this way, one sees archaeology playing a very important role and questions around archaeology, one sees the, um, a, an anthropology of the Maroons as being important. One sees, um, for example, the ar 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 anthropology of, of indigenous, um, one could suggest Guyana as important. But one sees a certain kind of absence of 
what what you would have regard here as black american life in a certain sense there is a a way in which certain notions become central and others just disappear as not being anthropological haiti is seen as anthropological in a certain sense and museological so what is the role you think in 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 attending to these spaces that david scott would 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 describe in this in this article where he's thinking about Sidney Mintz's work these spaces that troubles anthropology in its in its seeking for what it assumed to be primitive life. What was the role of Suriname, and how do you understand it as troubling our understanding of the history of anthropology as we've come to know it? It's interesting because um, when I began this project, I never thought I would end up in Suriname doing a other kind of research. And it wasn't because my project searching for evidence and archival material uh, related to the field work some of these people made in, in places like Suriname, Bahia, and Haiti, and, and so forth, uh, that I end up in Suriname. It was really by chance. It was really by chance, but I can't say that uh, since the book took a long time to be produced, when I began my project in, in, in a parallel project in Suriname, all the things I learned in Suriname, in a way, destabilized my own thoughts regarding material things, archival things. Uh, it's important to say that I was so tired about doing research in archives and on archives that when I began my project in Suriname, I, I said to myself, archives no more. <laughs> you should go to the field work and should go to uh, be with alive people, talk with them, feeling and, and exchanging, seeing, smelling, living with people, not through archival things. But uh, I, I, I remember when I, in 2018, I was in the process of finishing the book and I was living for a, for a period in Chicago. And I decided to go back to Northwestern to see um, some material I hadn't take the complete reference just to check some notes in the Herskovitz archive. And I, I came uh, with, I, I got a lot of uh, letters and things uh, exchanged uh, between uh, Dutch uh, travelers and scientists in Herskovitz. And, and I, I never, I, I didn't uh, had used this sort of material in my previous visit to this archive because I wasn't interested in Suriname at all. My points, my, my references were Cuba, Cuba, Brazil, and, and US. But when I came back to this archive and found these things, I thought, why uh, Herskovitz findings on uh, Maroons and Suriname uh, were not um, completely um, received and recognized in the way he, Herskovitz, aimed to. You know, even though Suriname is uh, Maroons in Suriname, mainly, uh, are uh, taken as the more um, precise example of what Herskovitz called the Africanism in his scales of Africanism. His book wasn't read uh, in the way maybe he aimed to. I think he, it, the book didn't receive the uh, the full or interesting or engaging uh, reception. I think it was Herskovitz himself who used his book and his experience in Suriname to create this sense of 
being uh, in touch with different expressions of the Africanity or the African, Africanism in, in different parts of the Americas. And so uh, for me, the answer to this question has to do with the fact that I think uh, as Richard and Sally Price try to show in, in their tiny book, The Roots of the Roots, uh, Herskovitz and Francis Herskovitz and Suriname spend more of their time collecting things and, and objects to be sent to different institutions in the in US. So in the case of Suriname, the objects, the artifacts had a different role. They, they, they made present in a way in which in other places like Haiti, like Salvador, the objects were in a secondary position and the interaction, the ethnographic material were much more important to Herskovitz and the, all the scholarship. And so in the case of Herskovitz, materiality was the key point of this sort of encounter when the North American anthropology encounter a so-called primitive African people in the floor, uh, in the forest of uh, Amazon uh, was um, gain a, a, a presence made appearing as being an object, as being an artifact. And so uh, I, I think a, a, a correspondent uh, situation we can find in the case of Benin, in which, uh, uh, about which uh, Susan Blee made uh, some articles about the way uh, the Herskovitz couple did their research in, in Benin. And the same situation can be compared between Benin and Suriname. This, this very, the centrality of the objects, the currency of objects, the transit of objects. This sort of thing didn't happen in this same way in the case of Herskovitz in Brazil. Uh, in Haiti, I can't say for sure because, as I said, it, it wasn't my, my main focus. In the case of Salvador, it was very interesting because he spent 10 months, a little bit more than, in, less than one year in Salvador. And at the end, he put a, a great book of the things he collected in Brazil in a boat to be sent to US. And the boat sunk, the German. <laughs> and so in, in Bahia, people, people said that it wasn't by chance, of course. <laughs> it had to be this way. And because a lot of things were exchanged in complicated situations, and, and so this thing must to be in the in the ocean <laughs> should be there. Uh, and and but in, in in other parts, some musics and and some material uh, reached the, the U.S. and he could bring a lot of things, but. I think the collection about Brazil is, uh, I don't know, Malika, if you can tell us about that, but I think the Herskovitz collection about Brazil is a, a small part of uh, the things he collected. Now, I want to ask um, Kira if, if, if you could also reflect on, you know, what the, the, the Caribbean, anthropology of the Caribbean um, does for anthropology as a discipline and how we might think through the Caribbean as a site for critiquing, um, including its materiality and whole material culture. And then I want perhaps um, to go back to a, a certain kind of, so when you insert Ortiz in between Malinowski and Herskovitz, what you're, what you're also doing is, is broadening the, the framework of the actors and actants that are participating in the making of this project, right? Um, 
many of us might know Ortiz as being a participant, many of us don't. And when you work from Jamaica, for example, and you know of the work, for example, of Catherine Dunham, who, who comes to Jamaica to study the Maroons in, in the 1930s, or you know of other um, um, women anthropologists who were working in the Caribbean. One of the things that this book does nicely, it is exactly to try and tease out those figures who were participants in the making of the project, but who are never named in the project. In our museums, we love use the word agency and to say that we are trying to identify the agency of those people. And one of the difficulties I find with that is what does agency mean under colonial domination? So we have to also tease that out, right? So what would you suggest to us, um, 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 Olivia, as a methodology of thinking through, in the very messiest of ways, the agency of those who participated in this project of anthropological writing, which includes the making of the archive? And how do we deal with the relationships of power that attend to that making? That, 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 that also, you know, one could call it practices of refusal or resistance, but also in its own um, fact that sometimes you, you cannot refuse because you are in a colonial setting. What, what is at stake in those others helping to make that archive that we now have? Um, I, I think you could go to Fabian and think about questions of present and co-present and those kind of things. That is my question, but perhaps first, Kira, the Caribbean, and the Caribbean as a part of that anthropological project. But I should, uh, you are not an anthropologist yourself, are you? I'm not an anthropologist, but Sorry. I conduct, <laughs> no, but I do conduct ethnographic research. That's okay, one right, of my good. primary methodologies. And mm -hmm. I, um, so I really appreciate this question because I think it's important to hold our anthropologists accountable, even as we rely upon their very important methods. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so t let me let me step back and say that I really appreciate um, Olivia, your encouragement of us to consider who are the others and what types of others we are um, framing as the intellectual grandfathers and a few grandmothers of the cultural past. And the reason that I say that is because in Haiti, for instance, you have a very interesting and, and different sort of uh, intellectual history. Uh, what's fascinating is Western scholars who came to Haiti, yes, we did in some ways start off um, with those such as Melville Herskovitz, Alfred Metro, um, George Eaton Simpson, but interestingly, uh, Zora Neale Hurston is there in Haiti conducting research in 1936 at the same time as Catherine Dunham, who has just come back from her research with Maroon communities in Jamaica. Um, and so you have a very interesting legacy of intellectual history first being uh, chronicled, archived, if you will, by women of color in the United States, by African American women specifically. Shortly thereafter, in the late 1940s and early 1950s, you have Maya Darren, who in, you know, by all circumstances we regard as a white woman, but who is an immigrant, who is a Ukrainian Jewish woman who comes to the United States as a young woman. Later you have people um, who come like in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, but so you have this early genealogy of intellectual history from Haiti that is not simply chronicled by white men, but also by white women and very importantly by African American women. And Zora Neale Hurston and Catherine Dunham both of whom I regard as artists in some ways before ethnographers, are coming as protege students of Melville Herskovitz at Northwestern, that's Catherine Dunham, and Franz Boas, that's Zora Neale Hurston at Barnard, right? And so this creates a fascinating sort of rivalry between intellectual histories of the parent teachers, if you will, but also between these two Black women. Uh, there's a scholar at the University of Miami named Marina Magloire who has written a fantastic article um, called Catherine Dunham's Ethics of Discomfort. I really encourage you all to check it out should you be interested, um, in part because one of the things that she establishes is that there was a rivalry between Hurston and Dunham that was in some ways interpersonal. Uh, Dunham explains that she was concerned that Zora Neale Hurston didn't pay her any attention, didn't pay her any mind. Zora Neale Hurston was upset because part of her funding from the Rosenwald Foundation was uh, reneged 
and then actually given to Catherine Denham. So there's tension over, you know, resources. She's also concerned that Denham has not done adequate preparation and research background the way that Zora Neale Hurston does. Um, but there's also more than that, right? This isn't simply interpersonal. It's rather the understanding that there cannot be more than one Black woman anthropologist in the 1930s or in the 1940s for that matter, or we could argue until today. Right? There's this understanding that you can have as many white male researchers conducting field work on the ground without there being concern over the reproduction of knowledge, but that heaven forbid there be more than one African American woman. Well, we've already heard that perspective. Right? And so their conflict wasn't simply something that was imagined. Rather, it was a, a reflection of the system and a reflection of the structural powers suggesting, implying that their value, their, their voices and their perspectives could only be of interest and of value you know, a little bit at a time. Um, so I do want to point that there's a, a very interesting lineage of Haitian cultural history and anthropology specifically being conducted by women from an early era. Um, and then the second point that I want to make regarding the objects specifically, um, you know, in I think Kate Ramsey does a fantastic job, historian and anthropologist Kate Ramsey does a fantastic job in her book Spirits in the Law, um, talking about how actually folklore and performance were probably some of the most um, tangible archives, if you will, being shared with the world during the 1940s and the 1950s in Haiti. And arguably, this is something that you could say is happening even today. But part of the reason that I think that this was happening is in part because of Catherine Dunham's work as an ambassador of dance, because she herself performed in Haiti and then also inspired by Haitian, Haitian sacred dance, went back to the United States, continued with her um, ballet company for black people began a technique known as the Catherine Denham technique. She actually trained Maya Darren, who was a filmmaker who went to study ritual dance, eventually got initiated. And all of these scholars, Zora Neale Hurston, Catherine Denham, and Maya Darren were not simply ethnographers and were not simply artists, novelists, dancers, filmmakers, but also practitioners. Right. And so again, this is a blending of positionality of outsider and other and insider because there was an assumption that Herskovitz and Boaz had that Dunham and Hurston would be able, in fact, to gain access to Haitian Vodou, gain access to cultural inside knowledge because they were Black. And of course, what we find in Hurston and Dunham's writings is that there were many, many ways in which they still felt like outsiders, in which they were still navigating barriers of language, in which they were still trying to identify how they fit in terms of position. The last thing I'll say regarding objects specifically, the anti-superstition campaigns of Haiti in the early 1900s and in the 1940s proved devastating to the material legacies of Haitian cultural history. Um, this is something that you see to a certain extent in Cuba and in Brazil as well, that you had state police who were raiding temples in Haiti, who were destroying uh, shrines, who were, destro who were killing uh, priests and priestesses. But what's, what's tragic in Haiti is in addition to the devastation and destruction of these temples, which we can understand as archives of religious history, the objects themselves were often burned. And they were burned by the Catholic state in Haiti, and they were also burned by state police in Haiti. Um, and so, in fact, in Cuba, you have a very different dynamic whereby a lot of these objects that were taken from temples, particularly in Abaqua communities, were then created created their own archive of a police museum. And still today in Cuba, you have a police museum that has some of the most extensive collections of sacred artifacts from Abaqua communities, from Santaria and Lukumi communities. These objects were not saved for the most part in Haiti. They were burned in the anti-superstition campaigns. And I think that this is actually one of the reasons why folklore and performance in Haiti became the sort of uh, uh, legacy that was presented to the world as opposed to their cultural artifacts. No, no, we, we, we seem to be running short of time and we should not be able to because this is getting so exciting. And, but I still want to, 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 to go back to that question that I asked about that method of thinking through finding those voices um, within the archives itself. And also tie that to a notion that you bring up in the book and probably you can start by introducing that. You, you, you start, I think it was with chapter three or four uh, five, chapter five, around questions of tracing and the notion of what it means to trace. And perhaps you can introduce that as a method, a way of thinking 
and let us and then go into you know how do we trace those those voices that we don't normally hear in these conversations around what the archive is yeah the, this is interesting because this chapter is precisely uh, in which i i could express my concern about not making a book not writing a book that sounds encyclopedic in terms of uh, addressing all the names and all the people that circulate that did research there and there a lot of people got completely outside of the, the reach of the book uh, and some of them i, I thought will be problematic uh, for instance gilberto freire uh, i was prepared for everybody asking me why didn't you include uh, Gilberto Freire in your book. I, I had already a, an answer <laughs> prepared to it, but others, these others that you are interested in, and I am, I was, and I am interested. To me, I was more interested in, in looking at their presence, looking at their trajectories, their participation in a different the sort of framing. Instead of looking at the students of Herskovitz and identifying Catherine Durham and saying she was there and there and went to this place, but looking at her experience through her relationship with Herskovitz, I would prefer to look at her archival, her writings or her things, and through this material, understand her own way to describe other relationships, including her relationship with Herskovitz, and not using her relationship with Herskovitz as being the whole history that we can tell about Catherine Durham. Since I couldn't do it, of course, <laughs> I couldn't do it for many people I, uh, I found in, in my wanderings through the archives. I decided to, to put it more complex, more as a, a possibility, always unstable uh, and problematic. And I think I did it precisely in this chapter five, Tracings, because when I identify that the great part of uh, work of creating a, a history of the beginning of Brazilian anthropology, for instance, relied uh, on the localization of Columbia University as being a kind of matrix, the center of a process of creation, different links and, 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 and networks. But looking at the letters and material exchange, I thought if we put Fisk University and not Columbia as being this place, what would be a history of African-American anthropology? At the same time, shifting the eye, this movement of shifting the position of the archive, archives, at the same time, doing this didn't allow me to reveal these other agencies, you know? Because looking at this project, maybe in, in, in not, not other material document, uh, documental um, a book of uh, material, I found uh, so many evidences of a colonial project. So it was precisely, precisely looking at this, the, the, the movement of African-American researchers going to the Deep South or going to the Caribbean or going to Brazil, that I found the, the uh, image of a colonial project in which African-American research were involved, they were part of it. And so this was very disturbing in all the time because we, we couldn't fit this present actual positionality in the past. 
And so many of these people went to Brazil and into Caribbean, uh, having the, the Department of State fellowship and support. They were part of a state support. And so, of course, in the fieldwork, a lot of uh, situation involving inequality, racial discrimination, uh, confront conflict happen. But in terms of the project I had in mind, looking at what the archives can say, what they say about this events, it was impossible impossible to me to separate completely these characters that became so marginalized in the history of anthropology. Maybe I hope that the book opens space to other people go into, for instance, the case of Irene Diggs. Irene Diggs is a, it's an amazing history. He, she was um, a student of Ortiz in Cuba, being an African-American woman uh, that acted as secretary of Du Bois. And she went to Cuba to study with Ortiz. It was a, a trajectory completely unique at that point. And then he went, she went to Brazil, she went to Uruguay. So, there are a lot of amazing, incredible stories of African-American uh, women and men that need to be taught and studied, but not from the point of view of their mentors, of a national anthropology, but from the point of view of their experience themselves if they left material artifacts, archival sources. That is perhaps where the, uh, the absolute difficulty is. And uh, probably we have to unfortunately be on our closing now. And I wanted to trouble you by, by actually, um, I really wanted to get to the last chapter where you did deal with transform things. But I can't, I can't do that because I want to go back to your opening where you said, you speak about this um, mural and the mural has the sentence, leave the past in the past. And I'm interested in that statement, especially at a time now when museums like ours are embroiled in a conversation about the, the archives that we hold. Um, what are these archives, if one takes objects as archives, the rights to hold them. But also some on the other side of the discussion who say all of that was in the past, right? It was collected in the past, leave the past in the past. So I want you to probably, in a last way, trouble us as museums to, to answer that question. What can these archives do for us in the present to be able to attend more closely to the difficult past out of which they emerge? And perhaps I want to ask you to, to, to also respond to that because we hold them. They vibrate, they, they trouble us, they're ghostly things, they haunt us. We, we push to forget the past out of which they emerge. What might your archival project around things of others do for us to think more critically about the archives that we hold today? Troublesome archives, probably as a last, last question. And, and, and I, I'm going to, uh, hopefully, I haven't missed anything from the audiences. I did ask that question. If there's anybody who has a question, please send it to, our, to us and I'll ask it. But you can trouble that last question a little bit. Yeah, um, I, I use a um, question that was made to me by um, someone in Salvador when I went back with the material and she was very curious to see, uh, to understand how and why I had dig these old things in the archives. And the question was that, why? What moved you toward the archives? Who, what kind of force? What kind of force led you to the archives and brought you back to Salvador with these things? 
for some people, this transit uh, was very disturbing. Né? As I, I, I try to, to, to describe and show in the, the final chapter. To others, it was like a gift. Someone went there and brought back this material, but they were aware that the power of going to the archives and bring things back were not shared with them. And so one point is important to reaffirm, archives are still a very important producers of power that are shared unequally and differentially through us and some of us. And so I had the power of going there, looking to some things. And in, 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 in the case of my research of Suriname, I decided when I escaped somehow from the field work and went to Paramaribo to look for some information, I did back with to my um, Juca friends and family and Mungo and share with them. And, and, and she, a, a friend of, uh, of me said, yes, you should do that, that because people don't do that. You should do that. But I was aware that the uses of this material that I did was completely different to the uses of this material among my friends there. So I think as a kind of invitation, trying to react to your question here, is maybe to persuade the museums and archives to open different uses of this material. Because it's not just making things public. It's not just make things online, available online. There are a lot of interesting sources online uh, by Dutch institution and other institution, Brazilian also, but what kind of skills, interactions uh, that you, we, we need to read, to have access to dialogue with the archives? What uses can be done uh, of these things. Uh, an answer put by somehow, I think, by the audience about the, the metaphorical idea of the pot in our present times, the idea of destruction, could be used in a more radical way, you know? Uh, you know, somehow, some, uh, there are a lot of um, uh, um, uh, technical, moral, disciplinary procedures to get close to the museums, to get close to the archives. And so the, 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 my first chapter, I try to, to follow the way of, uh, of describing scientific pro, uh, produ uh, producers, uh, procedures, sorry, uh, to, to, to try to imagine the archives as a kind of machine that produce all the time power. Everywhere you look at, you see archives producing power, archives producing money, archive, archives uh, uh, try to reach a sponsor, try to invent uh, events, try to create new possibilities that move money, power, and more inequality somehow. And we need to think about that. And I don't know, I don't have answers. I, I know about wonderful efforts that you are doing at the Research Center uh, of Material Culture and, and other people in other institutions. But I think we need to include not only the museums, but the archives, other kind of sources, other kind of uses, other kind of purposes of gathering such kind of, uh, of documents or artifacts or archives. I don't know if it's, it is my last uh, answer. I, I want to thank you <laughs> so much for this incredible talk. Uh, and Alessandra Benedict Koken again and, and, and Kiria Malika for this wonderful 
ideas and thoughts and in in conversation. And well, Judy also. Well, you know, there is so much that I have here on paper to ask you about your engagement with the KPLV, to ask you about <laughs> Uh, what you talk about to, to bring back histories uh, and questions of zigzag. To ask you about the relationship between Bruno Latour and your work with, with, with question of the actant. Um, to ask you about your interest in new materialism. And, and all of these things are what this book brings to the fore. So for me, actually, the, the, the the compelling nature of that idea of rethinking the object, what that artifact is, what it does, and to rethink that again in the present is one part of the book that I find rich and, and wonderful and important. But there is something else that I really like, and I think that it, it demands us of, of us more work to do, is the ways in which you have managed to connect so many different actants that have participated in creating what we've come to know as the archive now. Because I, I personally would never, and this is probably my own limitation, would never have put together, um, or I didn't know of it, sorry, that is it, the, the way you bring together Malinowski with, with her space. The way that conversation goes on with what was happening with Boas as well, and all of the different players who are creating this early moment are, are pulled together in this book as a site of networking knowledge formation, and as you say, a site of power. And that richness is a kind of richness that I'd love for us to be able to take into our archive as museum, to be able to find those connections into the, in the museum as well, which demands a certain kind of work. The limitation in that is sometimes as as museum, we, we tend to, we tend to, privilege the fact that that research needs to be done. And sometimes we do not necessarily attend to the violence that the archive is. And that privileging of the 50 years of research that needs to be done before we know, sometimes makes us push aside the project of what the archive might be able to do to participate in repertory histories in justice projects, in projects of thinking what refusal might look like. So the question then that you pose to us in this publication is how do we attend to all of those things at the same time? And you probably say it is impossible. But I will go back to another part of your work, which I think is the hopeful part, which says that it might be impossible, but it is still necessary. <laughs> and we have to do it. So we can, we can foreclose the possibility of saying we'll never do it by saying that it is the burden of the museum to what Laura Pierce rightfully said, sorry to call your name if you didn't want me to, that perhaps a breaking of the pot is an attempt to not only know what is in it, but rather to undo the very structure that it is to be able to do that work that needs to be done. I want to thank you both. Kira, I want to thank you. Thank you for being here early in the morning, for you late in the afternoon for us, and to suggest to the audience that is with us that let us keep talking, thinking with, think the things, like I'll show it to you again, the things of others, a book that demands that we, as museum workers, rethink again what our archives, the potentialities of our archives, to know about histories, but to know about how histories connect with us in the present. Actually, the past, we probably can never leave the past in the past because the archive of the past lives with us in the present. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much to both of you, to all of you. It's been a true pleasure.